I'm a Nintendo fan. Can't you tell? At this point, everyone and their dog has heard of Nintendo. Nintendo's current system, the Nintendo Switch, has become one of the most successful video game systems ever, seeing just behind Nintendo's very own DS and Sony's PlayStation 2. And while Nintendo's at the top of the gaming industry right now, it hasn't always been that way. The company obviously started successful, if not, they wouldn't still be making hardware today. But each generation of systems brings a whole new story for Nintendo, whether it be a story of success like the Wii or a story of failure like the Wii U. Seeing how much Nintendo has evolved over the years is something that fascinates many fans, including myself. Just the idea of seeing how much the company has grown, what put them on top, what didn't, is such a fun thing to look at, especially to someone as obsessed with the company that makes the funny plumber games like me. With that said, what's up everyone, it's me, the biggest nub on YouTube, Christendo here, and there's only one place to start this big ass piece of plastic. So we all know the story of the NES. Nintendo was at the top of the game market in Japan thanks to their newly released Famicom or Family Computer System, but the video game market in the West was at an all time low thanks to the video game crash of 1983. Basically, consumers believed that video games up to this point were just a fad, and thanks to a combination of oversaturation of too many video game systems, poor quality video games, and the declining interest of video game systems in favor of personal computers, the video game market was dying out, but Nintendo saw this as an opportunity to grow. Nintendo had a mastermind idea. Instead of promoting their new system as a video game console, they purposely redesigned the Famicom to look more like an entertainment system, more specifically a VHS system, thus giving it the name Nintendo Entertainment System. Nintendo also marketed the system as a toy by including the NES Zapper and Rob accessories, as well as bundling it with the original Super Mario Bros. game. The NES had a soft launch in New York and New Jersey in October of 1985, and continued to slowly roll out until it went nationwide in September of 1986, selling a total of 61.91 million units in its lifetime. The NES was a success, how it was so successful that it saved the video game industry and reinstated some of the trust that was lost. A lot of the NES's success can be traced back to Super Mario Bros, often regarded as one of the most influential video games of all time. Thanks to its simple controls and challenging yet forgiving gameplay, Nintendo was able to show the world that there's still hope for great quality games in the industry. And they were right about this. Not only did Nintendo create the most iconic video game character in history with the NES, but the system was also home to plenty of their other flagship franchises. There's The Legend of Zelda, an action-adventure game featuring Link that gives players the ability to explore the vast world of Hyrule with a nice blend of action, puzzle-solving, and exploration, as well as Metroid, a platforming shooter game featuring Samus that has players traversing the planet seems to retrieve Metroid stolen by the Space Pirates. Many other of their series started on the NES, like Kirby, Kid Icarus, Punch-Out, Ice Climbers, but the first three mentioned were some of the most iconic games at the time and defined their respective genres. The NES is home to mini games are important to the gaming industry, as without the system, we wouldn't have some of the Nintendo franchises we know and love today. But I think we also owe some of the NES's success to its controller. The NES controller is one of the most iconic controllers in gaming. Its simple rectangular design, featuring the D-pad, A and B buttons, and started select buttons, made it so easy for newcomers to pick up and learn right away. The buttons on the controller are nice and responsive, as you would expect from a controller, and they have a great quality feeling, making satisfying clicking sounds when you push them. One complaint some may have with the NES controller is that it hurts to hold for long periods of time because of the fact it is a rectangle, but I personally never found this a problem as I'm not one of those monsters who grip a controller so tight to the point it breaks. How did that happen? With the company becoming well known worldwide, Nintendo wanted to expand their market to handhelds as well. This brings us to the NES Handheld Edition. I mean the Nintendo Game Boy. And Nintendo made the right choice by entering the handheld market, as the Game Boy will prove to be one of their best selling systems ever. The idea of the Game Boy came from Gunpei Yokoi, as after the success of the NES in the West, he sat down with Nintendo president at the time, Hiroshi Yamachi, and told him he could make a handheld system with interchangeable cartridges. To Yokoi, the handheld needed to be small, light, and durable, while also having a recognizable game library. Nintendo believed the appeal of a game system was determined by the quality of its games, so Yokoi and Sutaro Okada led the development of Super Mario Land, a handheld entry of the Super Mario series. Super Mario Land was initially planned to be the pack and title with the Game Boy, but after a Soviet Union made game Tetris was brought to Nintendo's attention, they felt the game's gameplay was more suitable for a handheld, and they made a port of the game to be a pack and title with the system. The Game Boy launched in North America on July 31st, 1989, with it selling a total of 118.69 million units in its lifetime. The Game Boy was met with a lot of praise, being called the future of gaming, but there were still problems consumers have with it, such as the fact of it being big and bulky, requiring a lot of batteries, no backlit screen, and the screen itself not having any color besides the ugly green background. Nintendo answered these criticisms by making new iterations of the Game Boy in its lifetime. The first one is the Game Boy Pocket, which released on September 3rd, 1996 in North America and was a smaller, lighter model of the system, requiring less batteries, but it still had the problem of no backlit screen. For that, you'd have to wait until 1998 for the release of the Game Boy Lite, which includes a backlit screen. But there's a catch. This version was only released in Japan. Why would they not make a Game Boy Lite for North America? <laughs> 
Nintendo would eventually release a version of the system that includes color later on, but we'll cover that one in a bit as many would consider that its own system. The Game Boy was also home to many great games. The most obvious one is Tetris, a puzzle game having players rotate different shaped pieces that descend onto the playing field, with the game ending if the pieces end up reaching the top of the screen. The Pokemon series, which may be frowned upon nowadays, was also started on the Game Boy with Pokemon Red and Blue, these games having you catch and train creatures called Pokemon to be the 8 gym leaders and become the best trainer. And you can't forget Super Mario Land, Mario's first handheld adventure that, while being kind of clunky today, was a novelty at the time. And all this was possible on a tiny handheld system. Thanks to it having a simple control design like the NES controller, it was easy for newcomers to pick it up and understand it with very little problems. Add on to the fact that you can now play games on the go, Nintendo struck gold with the Game Boy, but despite how strong things were going for Nintendo at the time, competition was starting to ramp up going into the next generation of consoles. While Nintendo was basking in the success of the NES and Game Boy, new rival Sega released a new console to compete against Nintendo's success, this being the Mega Drive or better known as the Genesis, which launched in North America in 1989. Unlike the NES, which supported 8-bit graphics, the Genesis offered players next-gen 16-bit graphics as well as better audio quality, with the system featuring a new rival to Nintendo's Mario with Sonic the Hedgehog as a pack and title. Nintendo was initially in no rush to release a new system, however due to the company starting to lose its lead in the video game market, they reconsidered this and began work on the Super Famicom. The console was designed by Masayuki Yamura, who designed the original Famicom system, with the console launching in Japan on November 21st, 1990. With Nintendo once again being the top of the market in Japan, they made a redesigned version of the Super Famicom for the West, called the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, or SNES, with a limited stock available on October 23rd, 1991, and a nationwide launch on September 9th the same year. The SNES sold 49.10 million units in its lifetime, which is a significant drop in sales compared to its predecessor. And just because the SNES sold less than the NES doesn't mean it's a bad system. Now even despite releasing after the Genesis, the funny Red Plumber was still able to beat that stupid blue hedgehog. The Super Nintendo is regarded as being home to some of the best 2D games ever, with some of its experiences aging well even 30 years later. While NES games are fun, a lot of them have an age as well as what the SNES offers. Take for example Super Mario World, which many would consider the best 2D Mario game. The game controls very well, its level design holds up, and it's still an enjoyable experience to this day. The Donkey Kong Country trilogy on SNES is also regarded as some of the best games on the Super Nintendo, the games having great visuals for the system, and gameplay that, much like Super Mario World, holds up well all these years later. Yoshi's Island is also a graphical showcase, going for a more storybook type of aesthetic, making it arguably one of the most beautiful games on the SNES. Many of Nintendo's other franchises started out on the system, like Mario Kart with Super Mario Kart, F-Zero, Star Fox, and the Mother series, with some already established series getting what are regarded as the best games in the franchise on the system, like Metroid with Super Metroid and the already established Super Mario World. The SNES, despite being such an old system, still holds up remarkably well, thanks to its many excellently crafted games. And the controller as well is well crafted. It was the first controller to include shoulder buttons, and while many games at the time didn't use them, it was still a great addition. It also included the addition of the X and Y buttons to coincide with the A and B buttons, and to round it off, the controller features a design that makes every button easily accessible, while also being super comfortable to hold. The SNES is just an amazing system all around. Its excellently crafted game library, great controller design, leads to this being the ultimate 2D gaming system. Add on to the fact that this is backwards compatible with Game Boy games with the Super Game Boy accessory, this was, at the time, the ultimate gaming system. But things were about to change for gaming very soon. With the introduction of a brand new dimension with 3D, all starting on the Nintendo 6. Hey, what the heck is wrong with you? How could you forget the best era of Nintendo, the Virtual Boy? Only a fake fan would miss this glorious piece of Nintendo knowledge. I'll take it from here. Alright, so the Virtual Boy. Everyone knows what this is, right? So, Nintendo was working on their new system. Good for them. But it was taking them a little while to get this thing out. So Nintendo was like, time to sell out. So Nintendo revealed and announced the Virtual Boy, Nintendo's 32-bit system. As someone who unfortunately has come face to face with this thing, I thought I'd give my input. So how exactly does this thing work? Well, it uses stereoscopic 3D, similar to what the 3DS uses, which simulates 3D visuals. Only problem is, it's all in red. By doing this, they made sure that the Virtual Boy would be affordable yet still fun. With the price tag of $179.95 and the visuals of the future, the Virtual Boy must have sold well. At least 770,000 in one system. So joy! Another big point would be the controller, more specifically the inclusion of two whole D-pads. I mean, it's fine, it works, but like, why two D-pads? I mean, sure, they feel great, but they're just not needed. Moving on to the games, let's talk about the games. Personally, I've only played two Virtual Boy games, being Mario's Tennis and Mario Clash. First of all, Mario's Tennis, the thing, well, it's, it's just tennis! I mean, sure, there's Mario in it, but it's no Mario Tennis on the N64. Wait, are those the same thing? Shut up. And then Mario Clash, who could forget Mario Clash? All this game really has is a 3D Mario Bros. You know, the arcade game. The game's not the best, but it's still fun. I would definitely recommend it to anyone starting out with their Virtual Boy. I guess I'll hand things back over to Chris. Take it away, fanboy. 
Okay then, anyways, the Nintendo 64. Silicon Graphics Inc, or SGI, we're looking to expand by adapting our supercomputing technology into the consumer market, starting with the video game market. The company made a proposal for a video game chipset, and we're looking for an established partner in the market, with Sega as their first option and Nintendo as their second. CEO of Sega of America, Tom Kolinsky, was impressed by SGI's prototype, but after engineers found several hardware problems with the prototype, Sega ultimately turned on the partnership. Nintendo, however, agreed to this partnership and were set on starting work on Project Reality with an initial release window of late 1995. On June 23rd, 1994, Nintendo announced the official name of the unfinished console, Ultra 64, with the console's design, which is similar to the final design we got, being revealed to the public late into the year. Nintendo had plans to release the console under the name Ultra Famicom in Japan and Nintendo Ultra 64 in other markets, but they instead decided to establish a single worldwide branding for the console with the name Nintendo 64. Despite the initial plans to release the Nintendo 64 in late 1995, the release date for the console in North America ended up being September 23rd, 1996, and the system sold 32.93 million units in its lifetime. For being the first ever system to support 3D gaming, the Nintendo 64 was able to do some truly magnificent things with the technology. The games on the system may not have aged as well as, say, some NES games as they are a bit clunky, being the first ever 3D games, but they're still really important to video game history, and some are even regarded as the best video games of all time. The most important game on this system is easily Super Mario 64. The game has players exploring different worlds accessible through paintings found in Peach's castle, and the game to this day is seen as important to 3D gaming as the original Super Mario Bros. game was to 2D game. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time was also a huge step for gaming going into 3D, as it expanded heavily on the gameplay of the 2D games that came before it thanks to the additional Y-axis, as well as cementing the foundation of 3D adventure games to come. The system also saw the first 3D Mario Kart game with Mario Kart 64, the game featuring different track themes rather than variants of the same themes, a Mario RPG that takes the characters we all know and love, as well as new faces in a paper World and Paper Mario, as well as the birth of the Super Smash Bros. series, featuring 12 of Nintendo's most iconic characters at the time and having them duke it out in a 2D fighter game. Friendships were also broken not only through Smash Bros., but in the Mario Party series that started on the system, with the gameplay having players take turns moving on a board and then playing mini games in between turns to get coins in order to buy stars to win. As you can see, the Nintendo 64 was home to games that were either influential to the video game industry or were just straight up fun to play. You could go as far as to say that the Nintendo 64 is one of the most important video game consoles ever made, and because of that, the controller must be equally game changing, right? What the hell is this? When designing controllers, Nintendo always to be a bit creative, but I swear whoever came up with the design for the Nintendo 64 controller was on crack. The controller is shaped like an M and features the D-pad, A and B buttons, C buttons, the left and right triggers, and the start button. It also features the first ever joystick on a controller, but I gotta say it feels really cheap and feels like it'll fall off at any time. Oh yeah, and there's a Z button on the back of the controller for some reason. One of the biggest problems with the N64 controller is the fact that it's basically impossible to use all the buttons at once. I think Nintendo's idea with the design is to make it so you can change how you hold it based on if you're playing a 2D or 3D game, but the controller just feels so awkward to hold, and the buttons just feel fine to push. They don't feel as high quality as the ones on the SNES controller. The Nintendo 64 was such a revolutionary yet strange console. At the time, all the competition were using disc, allowing developers to store more data in their games, but for some reason, Nintendo stuck to cartridges, which were more expensive to produce and couldn't store as much data. This generation was such a weird one for Nintendo, having a controller that looks like it was made for aliens, using cartridges instead of disc, but you know what they say, if it ain't weird, it ain't Nintendo, am I right? Speaking of weird decisions, Nintendo continued having these with the Game Boy Color. Instead of making a full-on successor to the Game Boy, Nintendo instead to make a slightly more powerful version of the system, but now with a colored screen. Nintendo started work on the Game Boy Color in 1996, as game developers were saying the current Game Boy was too weak for what they were trying to develop, and the system launched in North America on November 18th, 1998. There isn't really much to say about the Game Boy Color, as at the end of the day, it's just another Game Boy. Sure, there were some games that were exclusive to the GBC, but a lot of games were compatible with both systems, with there being the bonus of all Game Boy games getting added color on the Game Boy Color. And for some reason, despite the fact that it was one of the biggest complaints on the OG Game Boy, the Game Boy Color didn't have a backlit screen. What sense does that make, Nintendo? Moving on to the true successor of the Game Boy, the Game Boy Advance was revealed for the first time on September 1st, 1999. Nintendo teased that the system would be launching in Japan on August of 2000, with the rest of the world gained the system shortly after by the end of that year. Alongside the release date tease, Nintendo also announced a partnership with Konami to create technology that allowed the GBA to interact with Project Dolphin, Nintendo's upcoming home console. The launch of the Game Boy Advance was pushed back to 2001, with the system launching on June 11th that year in North America and selling a total of 81.51 million units. Rather than going with the portrait design and buttons below the screen like its predecessor, the GBA went with a landscape design and had its buttons on the side of the screen. The buttons remained the same as the original Game Boy, but there were also shoulder buttons added to the system, allowing for more input options. However, the system did once again launch without a backlit screen. What's your deal with no backlit screens on your handhelds, Nintendo? Nintendo finally solved this issue for good though with the Game Boy Advance SP, which launched in early 2003. On top of featuring a backlit screen, the SP also featured a clamshell design, which allowed for the system to be more easily carried around. Nintendo also released the last Game Boy model with the Game Boy Micro in 2005. The system, as the name implies, is the smallest version 
version of the Game Boy and features the ability to change its faceplates. Nintendo created this model to show that their handhelds can be fashionable, but to no one's surprise, the system ultimately left no impact on the gaming industry. Much like the Game Boy, the Game Boy Advance features interchangeable cartridges, with its cartridges being way smaller than its Game Boy counterpart. The Game Boy Advance was also backwards compatible with all Game Boy and Game Boy Color games outside of the micro redesign, but the system really does tell people you're playing ass old Game Boy games, as one version gets a tumor, and the other one gets a little excited. The Game Boy Advance once again featured great games. Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire regard as some of the best Pokemon games, and not only were those games on the GBA, but the original Pokemon games got a remake in the form of Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green. There was no new mainline Mario game on the system unfortunately, but some of Mario's classic adventures from the NES and SNES were brought to the system through the Super Mario Advance series. Mario and Luigi got the start of a wacky RPG series with Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga, and the birth of Cringe, or Fire Emblem at least in the West, happened on the system as well. What a truly remarkable system the Game Boy Advance was. Having a library of very solid games to call its own, as well as having access to the endless Game Boy library truly really makes this system one to remember. Much like the SNES, this was 2D games at their peak. But the game isn't over just yet, as we still gotta talk about Nintendo's next home console, the GameCube. Announced on May 12th, 1999, the GameCube, or at the time Project Dolphin, was said to be the successor to the Nintendo 64. Before the launch of Project Dolphin, Nintendo developed and patented early prototypes of motion controls for the system, however, the concept of motion controls would not be used until the next generation Nintendo console. Prior to the console's release, Nintendo's main focus was the launch of the Game Boy Advance, and because of this, the company decided to take games that were planned to be for the Nintendo 64 and turn them into games that would launch early into the next console's life. The name of the new home console, GameCube, was announced at a press conference in Japan on August 25th, 2000, with the unveiling of some of its games showing off at E3 2001, such as Luigi's Mansion and Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leaders. The GameCube was originally set to launch in North America on November 5th, 2001, but was pushed back a couple weeks to November 18th so there was more stock at launch, and the system sold a total of 21.74 million units. Despite the fact that GameCube was one of Nintendo's worst selling systems, the console has one of the most iconic launch up screens, and was home to many great games including Karaoke Revolution Party. But seriously, despite the lack of sales and third party support because of the GameCube's performance, Nintendo carried this system hard with the amount of creative games they produced. This was the first Nintendo system to not launch with a Mario game, and instead a game starring Mario's weird, smelly brother Luigi, with a game that takes you through a haunted mansion to solve puzzles and defeat ghosts in Luigi's Mansion, which became an instant classic. Super Smash Bros. also had another entry to the franchise with Super Smash Bros. Melee, which the community refuses to move on from because of how competitive it was. And Mario Kart Double Dash was a new direction for the Mario Kart series, having you race with two characters rather than one, with one driving the cart and the other handling items. After Regarded as the best Paper Mario game, Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door takes what made the original so great and expanded heavily on it. And normal Mario finally gets to go on a vacation he deserved until he was framed with committing vandalism and has to use Flood to clean the island to stop Bowser and Super Mario Sunshine. The Metroid Prime series, having you play as Samus in a first person shooter adventure game started on the GameCube, as well as Pikmin, where you have to use Pikmin to help you collect all your ship parts in a certain time frame to escape the planet you crash landed on. Finally, the birth of Toon Link happened thanks to The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker, which has you exploring the flooded world of Hyrule as you try to save your sister, and I can't forget the best GameCube game of all time, Karaoke Revolution. Party. So the GameCube had great games, but what's the catch? There's always one with Nintendo. The company finally decided to use discs with the GameCube just like all their competition, but these discs are so damn small. Nintendo did this as a means to prevent piracy of their games or something along those lines, but it led to the discs not being able to hold as much data as competitors once again, as well as making them cost more to produce than just a normal DVD. On top of that, because the competition were using normal sized discs, you'd be able to listen to CDs on those consoles, whereas on the GameCube that's just not possible. Again, Nintendo with their weird and dumb decisions. Speaking of weird and dumb decisions, we have the GameCube. GameCube controller. Like, what even is this? The cheap feeling joystick? The weird feeling C buttons? Wait, I think I'm talking about the Nintendo 64 controller. I'm gonna sound like a broken record by saying this, but the GameCube controller is one of the best controllers ever made. Just how the buttons are situated with the X and Y wrapped around the top of A and B to the side, as well as the analog triggers, which allows you to control the pressure of certain things in games. There's also the joysticks, yes, that being poor old, that feel nice to use despite the yellow one being a little bit on the smaller side. The build of the controller as a whole just feels super high quality, from the buttons to the design to the joysticks, just everything about the GameCube controller makes it one of the best controllers in gaming and even Nintendo sees this as they still make this controller to this day. The GameCube was an era of innovation and risk, as Nintendo made many games that either put a spin on their respective series, or were just straight up new ideas that weren't seen in the industry at that point. On top of its own amazing lineup of games, the GameCube had an accessory that allowed you to play all Game Boy through Game Boy Advance games. However, despite the GameCube being the most powerful system on the market for that generation, Nintendo struggled to compete against Sony's PlayStation 2, as well as new rival Microsoft's Xbox. The NES to the GameCube is what I like to define as the classic era of Nintendo systems. As for these generations, Nintendo Nintendo was trying to have the most powerful system and the most innovative games. However, due to the GameCube not performing as well as Nintendo hoped, the company had to try something new. Something that hasn't been seen in the industry outside of a few rare occasions, gimmicks. Yeah. And thanks to the introduction to gimmicks moving into the modern era of Nintendo systems, we were able to get some amazing life-changing games like Action Girls Racing for the Wii. 